Okay, we are live. Welcome everybody. Uh, today we are together with Matthew Roche uh, from Microsoft uh, product team, Power BI product team. He is also a member of Power BI CAT team, customer advisory team. Uh, he's going to talk about adoption of data flows today and I think he will jump he, he will jump into the good stuff directly assuming that we already know enough about data flows. Uh, Q&A is open as you know uh, you can ask questions during the meeting at the end of the meeting uh, questions uh, regarding Metal music and swords is also allowed. <laughs> <laughs> OK, it, it, it's good to see you, uh, Matthew, and thanks well, for uh, accepting our invitation. It's really well, our pleasure to have you with us. Well, thank you for having me. It is my honor and pleasure to be here. I wish I could be there in person, but this will have to do uh, for this year at least. And please let me know when you're ready for me to start sharing. Yes, you can go. Excellent. So I am going to share my screen and I will let someone give me the verbal confirmation that you can see my screen. Yes, we do. Excellent. So let's uh, let's begin. So first of all, uh, uh, welcome and thank you. My name is Matthew Roach. I'm a program manager on the Power BI customer advisory team at Microsoft. The Power BI CAT team, as it's sometimes known, is essentially an embedded customer voice inside the product team that builds and ships Power BI. Uh, we do a lot of direct customer engagement, so we work with some of the biggest customers in the world. Uh, one way to think about what the CAT team does is that we make uh, customers successful when they're trying to push the limits of what's possible with Power BI. So if you think about some of my colleagues who are really deeply technical, the DAX experts and the M experts and so on and so forth, we can go in and engage and unblock these customers where others might not be able to help. And the other side of what we do is we bring back to the product team insights and guidance about the types of problems that these very large customers uh, are encountering so that we can evolve the product and drive the roadmap to better serve these needs. And I let me make sure that I am on the right screen so that I can uh, progress. So I've been working uh, personally on the Power BI CAT team for a little bit over two years or maybe going on two and a half years now. I've been with Microsoft since 2008. I've worked on Power BI, Azure Data Catalog, SQL Server Integration Services, Master Data Services, and Data Quality Services. So a lot of my Microsoft career has been around BI and information management. And before I joined Microsoft, Microsoft, I was primarily a data warehousing and ETL consultant building solutions using the SQL Server and Microsoft Data Platform. So I've sort of been doing this from a variety of different angles since the mid 90s. And one of the things that I love about my current job is I get to help people solve problems, but for the most part, I don't have to do any hard work. I get to you know, connect the pieces and, and see the people that are doing the hard work and help them be successful. That's really a sweet spot for me. And at this point, I'm going to stop sh uh, sharing my camera. Uh, we'll turn it back on during Q&A at the end, but I want to make sure that no one is distracted uh, by me and that my bandwidth isn't a problem. This will allow me to come through uh, and I am going to do a super fast intro because as I, you know, as I'm planning and doing the dry runs through this brand new slide deck, I realize that there is a little bit of context that's necessary. And this is to emphasize that data flows are part of what makes Power BI an end-to-end -end self service BI tool. So Power BI has always had capabilities for self service data visualization, self service data modeling, and self service data preparation. But before data flows were part of this end-to-end -end story, 
this central piece here, the capabilities or the, the, the value that is added by having a data warehouse or data lake in between those source systems and the analytic solutions downstream, uh, often the problems that this pattern solves are reintroduced by having your self-service data prep, the work that you do in Power Query, uh, part of your data model and not part of an intermediary layer. So when I think about data flows, first of all, I, I always emphasize like data flows are not a data warehouse, but I also say that data flows are a logical data warehouse because from a logical and conceptual perspective, data flows provide a lot of the same functionality that a data warehouse or a data lake will provide. The other thing that I want to emphasize is that uh, I see tons of questions about where do data flows fit in? How do I position them? How do I put them in context? Because if you think about Power BI data flows, they are an ETL tool. You can extract data from a bunch of sources, transform it however you want, and then load it into these reusable objects and entities for downstream BI and possibly other development. But we also have Azure Data Factory. We have SQL Server Integration Services. We have all of these third party ETL and data preparation tools. Why would I choose data flows in Power BI or for that matter in Power Apps and other Power Platform tools over another tool like Azure Data Factory? And the biggest thing for me is that data flows are focused on the citizen personas. Data flows are targeted at people who are comfortable in Power Query, the people that live in Excel more than they live in Visual Studio, the people that may not be comfortable or capable to open up uh, the Azure portal or Visual Studio or other pro tools and do a lot of technical code or need to make more technical decisions. So there's lots of problems that can be solved in either tool. So as a high order bit, the first thing that you look at is who's doing the work, what their capabilities are, also what are the problems that you're trying to solve. Uh, and I realize this is not a comprehensive uh, discussion of this interesting topic, but I do want to put that out there before we start talking about patterns. And there are two main sections that I have uh, in the, uh, the, the, the presentation or the slide deck today. And the first one is what I've labeled usage patterns. And when I say usage patterns, I say these are the problems that I see customers solving as they use data flows. And the next pattern we'll see, you know, what's the structure, what is the strategic approach that they take to solve these problems, uh, which would be the adoption patterns. But these data flow usage patterns, I see questions day after day after day, you know, where, where should I use data flows? How are other people using them? Is this a successful approach? And so on and so forth. So I want to start off by focusing on the types of problems that these successful enterprise customers that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis are solving using data flows and Power BI's. And the first one, this is a, a big bucket. You'll notice overlap between these patterns as I move on. The first one is what I have labeled citizen data warehousing. And, and let me just throw out there that on the the business applications group product team at Microsoft. So Power BI, Power Apps, Power Automate, uh, and the Dynamics 365 suite of, uh, of offerings. The term citizen is often used where a Power BI user might be a citizen analyst and a Power Apps user might be a citizen developer. What I've seen more and more is customers starting to talk about citizen data engineers, uh, which is between an analyst and a developer, uh, where that citizen data engineer will look at a little bit more on the next slide or, or future uh, later slides, uh, but they're essentially using Power BI data flows to deliver self-service applications that include the patterns of the data warehouse. So whether it's you know, like a full Kimball model or just bits and pieces of it will differ from team to team and from project to project. 
but most data flows usage involves a user using Power BI data flows to pull in data from multiple sources, to stage them, to do cleansing, to do standardization and enrichment, and then to have multiple downstream applications build their star schemas or the, the entities on which they will build their tabular analytics model, they can build those as entities in their data flows, or they can have parts of what ends up in their tabular model uh, uh, in data flows and the rest coming from other systems because they are composable entities. And I do need to emphasize I, this and this is this is really important because there has been some mixed messaging uh, over the past few years, but data flows do not replace a data warehouse. If you look at only the fact that you can pull data in and make it available for other uses, oh yeah, sure, that's great. Uh, but an enterprise data warehouse has other requirements other than the data itself. There are requirements around uh, management and monitoring. There are requirements around scale, both scale up and scale out, uh, and requirements about raw performance and concurrency. And because data flows in Power BI in their default state, so before you start taking the, uh, the enhanced compute engine, uh, which is a premium only feature into consideration, data flows are physically implemented as folders full of CSV files. And if you have files and folders, you will typically not have the performance that your users want as you start to scale beyond uh, smaller data volumes. But this pattern of citizen data warehousing is the canonical approach for data flows adoption inside large customers. There are two different varieties of, of what I've labeled as refresh consolidation here uh, that complement that citizen data warehousing pattern. The first one is that just sort of emphasizing that like a data warehouse, data flows allow you to reduce that overall refresh time by having you extract the data once on a schedule and a granularity and a scale and within the refresh window uh, that, that a specific data source requires. And you can pull it out once, land it into a location that is managed by and local to the Power BI service. And then with LinkedIn computed entities, you can simply pull from the data that's already in Power BI and which possibly has been shaped and refined to be closer to what your analytics purposes need. And this will prevent you from needing to repeatedly hit those external data sources again and again for each data set or for each analytics application as it refreshes. And there's one sort of technical point down towards the bottom of the slide, which doesn't really apply to the pattern, but it is relevant to some of the frequently asked questions that I hear. And the, the key point that I want to make is that when you use a linked entity, so when you're referencing an entity that exists inside another data flow, the data only gets physically stored once. So the actual data will exist in the workspace where the, uh, the source entity is defined. And if you export the JSON, that model.json metadata, you will actually see that for all of the entities in your data flow, there will be a partition information and a URL out to the storage where the files are located. And for every linked entity, which shows up as a uh, quote unquote reference entity uh, in that uh, JSON metadata, all there is is a link to the other metadata. There is no, uh, there is no uh, uh, partition information because the data doesn't live here. But from a patterns perspective, data flows give you the ability to reduce that overall refresh time and the cost that you pay from hitting those source systems, especially if the source system is something like a slow uh, REST API or file-based source. The other side of uh, the refresh consolidation is that every data flow can have its own refresh which gives you more control over when you're pulling data out of uh, a source system, both for the schedule uh, frequency and the schedule details. 
without a data flow, every time that you refresh your data set, you're going to be uh, running the queries to pull the data from every data source that the, uh, that the data sets reference. And you can't really control it. You can't really say, I'm going to you know, refresh these and not these. Data flows give you a lot more control around this. And this is particularly important when you either have a line of business system where doing a, a bulk data extraction isn't permitted by the system owners because the performance impact of that bulk query will bog down the transactions, the, the, the business transactions uh, that the system needs to support, and they have uh, a specific allowed ETL load window. And it's also important against data sources like APIs, and I'm not going to name any names, but there are lots of cloud vendors that will provide a REST API that allows you to get data out, but either they aggressively throttle those, uh, they aggressively throttle calls against the API, so beyond a given limit, it slows to a crawl, or beyond a given limit, they start charging you additional money as you're using the API more. And if you had 10 different data sets that are all calling the same API, you know, using your organization's API keys, uh, this can either bog things down or ratchet up the, uh, uh, the cost involved with the data solution. Uh, and by using data flows, you can have a single set of refreshes done by the data flow owner and not have to worry about each individual data set hitting that upstream API because the data sets will refresh against the data flows where the data is already cached and the source system is not affected uh, during the data set refresh. Uh, th there's a related question with that. Uh, is there any way to refresh the data flow only once on the first day of each month. Currently, there are only daily or weekly schema. Uh, so the, the short answer is yes, absolutely. There is an API that will allow you to refresh data flows. Uh, so uh, today, uh, there is no UI based refresh option uh, for, to the best of my knowledge, data flows or data sets that gives you a monthly uh, option. Uh, the APIs do make this relatively easy, but not everybody is comfortable calling APIs. Uh, the data flows team uh, is working on uh, some power platform and specifically power automate integration, and it hasn't been discussed publicly yet, so I'm not going to go into the details today, but I expect that Power Automate integration to make this easier uh, in, in one way. There is also an effort underway to consolidate what is currently the refresh center in the power platform admin tool. So there's like a, a lot of investment going on for refresh management in power platform. Uh, and uh, at some point in the future, so as some people will say in the fullness of time, this refresh center will be integrated into Power BI as well. But today, the only way uh, to have a first day of the month refresh for a data flow uh, is to use the REST API to trigger that refresh. Any other questions so far? Uh, yes, we have, but uh, I think it's well, better to answer them at the end of the session, more generic uh, ones. Excellent. I, I, I should have said any other relevant, uh, topic relevant uh -huh, questions. Uh, so, yes, yes, no. And excellent. Okay. So, uh, the, the next common usage pattern is around data consistency, and there are two different aspects to this. The one that we see called out most significantly and most commonly is just structural consistency. If you give two people Power Query and the same data sources and the same basic requirements, they're probably going to give you at least three or four different queries that all do the same thing in slightly different ways. and uh, by having a data flow that implements a query once, you can have structural consistency to ensure that a given entity, you know, logical entity, uh, is represented with the same attributes, you know, same columns, and the same logic that defines it. And even though this doesn't come up as often, it's just as important. Data flows also give you temporal consistency. 
because if you had 10 different data sets and they all refresh at 10 different times, they will have 10 different snapshots of the data as it existed in the source system at that point in time. With data flows, that temporal consistency comes from just refreshing once and getting, uh, uh, getting that data at a single point in time and then having all downstream data sets and other applications use it. Uh, data flows give you the ability to have your Power Query expert write a query that other analysts, other citizen users may not be able to write. Uh, and just as, as sort of a specific micro pattern, it's also a great way to have a table that doesn't get its data from anywhere, where you're programmatically generating uh, a date dimension or some other, uh, some other reusable data set that isn't actually coming from a source. So I've seen quite a few companies that will have uh, all of their calendars defined in data flows and they just point their uh, their self-service users at those locations. And then the final usage pattern before we get into uh, the adoption patterns, the final usage pattern that I see, so the problems that I see these big customers solving with data flows and Power BI is around discovery and connectivity. And in my introduction, when I was introducing myself at the top of the hour, I mentioned that I'd previously worked on a bunch of information management products, including uh, the first generation of Azure Data Catalog. So this is a pattern that I don't know if it would pop out for everyone because it seems like a lot of data professionals take discovery and connectivity for granted. We know where the data is because somebody gave us a connection string, a server name, a URL, uh, and we understand all of the nuances of uh, the authentication mode and the parameters that are required and all of these other things. But for a lot of business users, like for the other 95% of the people that could possibly be working with data, these are insurmountable barriers. These are really hard things. I don't know where the data is and I don't know who to ask. I don't even know who to ask to find out who to ask to get to the data. But with data flows, once a data flow exists, they are automatically discoverable in a consolidated hierarchical get data experience that lives in the tool where these users are already working with data and it provides uh, previews, it provides a zero configuration connection experience. So, you know, it's you're connecting to the service using the organizational account that you're already signed in with. You log in once to the service and everything just works. And when you think about some of the, the enterprise data sources that might require a dozen different parameters and specialized drivers that everybody needs to have installed and, and you know, the, the OneNote notebook where all of the connection information needs to be maintained and kept up to date, data flows can make these problems go away. And these successful enterprise organizations that I get to work with, they've been recognizing this and they've been putting the data that people need to work with into data flows and saying, go look here for this data, stop connecting to the source. And I will pause briefly for Q&A. Uh, uh, so if there are any other relevant questions that shouldn't wait, I will uh, gladly yes. take them now. Yes, uh, is there any way to use Power Automate to check any changes from the source which can trigger the data flow refresh? Um, I, I'm going to say probably. Uh, I am not a uh, I am not a Power Automate expert, so uh, in order to do this, what you would need to do uh, in Power Automate is to have a mechanism to pull for changes in the source. So you know that that's independent of data flows. That doesn't have anything to do with the data flows. You just need a way to look at the data source and to identify a change and once your criteria are met today there is no dedicated action in power automate uh, to say refresh data flow uh, but you can call the data flows rest api 
to trigger that data flow refresh if that's your goal. Uh, one thing to, to emphasize is that just as uh, uh, data sets do, data flows do have refresh limits. So unless your data flow is backed by premium, uh, whether that is dedicated premium capacity or a premium per user workspace, uh, so unless your data flow is backed by premium, uh, you will only have eight refreshes per day. If you are using premium, then you can refresh as many times as you want. The only limit is uh, you can't refresh if a refresh is already ongoing. So hopefully that answered the question. OK, one more similar question. Dataflow has its own refresh schedule. How, how can I trigger data set refresh automatically after Dataflow <laughs> completes? <laughs> Uh, wait, wait, wait a week. Uh, so, so this is this is uh, again. I, I mentioned during my introduction that the the joyous part of my work is I don't need uh -huh. to solve problems. I just need to talk about other people solving them. Uh, this is one of the things that I have been uh, mercilessly bothering the folks that own the Dataflow's APIs about. So my my inbox is filled with emails about this. Uh, we have an API that is in the process of being published that will allow you to uh, to identify when a data flow refresh is completed so that you can then trigger that data set refresh or other downstream action. Today the answer is you can't and what you would need to do is just to keep querying the status of the data flow which is an awful solution but as we speak so this is uh, Wednesday, Nova, uh, September 23rd. I don't even know what month it is, uh, but as of today, the API deployment is rolling out and uh, either next week or the week after the documentation around the API is scheduled to come out, which will make it actually accessible. Uh, but this is something that will be available programmatically in the very near future. And uh, as I mentioned uh, in an earlier response, I can't speak to the details of the Power Automate integration that is planned because it hasn't been discussed publicly officially yet, but we're definitely looking at ways to make this particular scenario easier so that you don't need to use an API. Uh, Matthew, I'm getting bombarded with with lots of questions. Maybe well, we should keep going and uh, try to answer all of the questions at the end at the end, at the end of the meeting. So let it be written. Okay. So let's get down to the nitty gritty. So this is this is sort of the real world view uh, of how these big customers uh, are uh, approaching data flows and making them work in their adoption of Power BI and. I've mentioned really big customers a couple times. Generally, the organizations that I work with and that I'm getting these insights from, they will often have thousands or tens of thousands of monthly active users in Power BI. So they've got, you know, often standardized where Power BI is their only tool or the only supported tool, that sort of thing. So, so these tend to be very uh, forward thinking, forward looking organizations. But even in these organizations, one of the things that really leaps out at me is that most people that build solutions in Power BI do not and will not develop data flows. And a lot of this comes down to the fact that data flows are all about the sharing of data and the reuse of data. And most analysts, most self-service BI users they're not thinking about making data reusable for other people like them. They're thinking about using data to solve a business problem so that they can deliver insights that others can use. And data flows solve a different problem than that. Data flows are a building block that can be part of these bigger applications, but the people that think about data reuse are typically different than the people that are solving uh, broad business problems by using data or the overlap between them tends to be relatively small. So I have seen a growing number of companies start talking about these citizen data engineers where they are people who are often in a business role. 
they are often the champions for Power BI uh, in their business group or in their department, uh, but they're not the average citizen analyst uh, that is building Power BI visualizations and models. Uh, and the organizations that are having the most success, they've recognized this difference between a citizen analyst citizen analyst and a citizen data engineer and they are deliberately building these competencies so they're reaching out and they're saying uh we've noticed that you're doing these things let's get you more training to make you you know more capable more impactful and and the like and a lot of this comes down to the fact as well that data flows today the authoring experience even though we probably take this for granted or we've we've gotten used to working around it but the fact that data flows need to be authored in the browser it's like the cloud only cloud first uh, authoring experience uh, this is a huge barrier for most people working in power bi and asking someone to leave the tool where they're doing the other 90 percent of their work go to a different tool to do 10 percent that they didn't need they didn't know that they needed to do in the first place and then come back into the tool where they wanted to be in the first place to uh to finish their work most analysts simply won't do this and and be aware that the you know the, the product team at Microsoft sees this and recognizes this challenge and and I personally believe that having this a single browser based authoring experience is where uh, you know it's, it's 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 a laudable goal to drive towards but having two different experiences where some things you do in one tool and some things you do in another tool but those things are both required to build the type of application that we're promoting the current authoring experience here is a real challenge that we shouldn't overlook either from a product team perspective or from the perspective of people who are working with users and customers uh, uh, who need to be successful. So we talked about authors. Let's talk about authoring patterns. So the, the real difference here is who's doing the work versus what is the work that they're doing and there is you know two two different patterns that i see so so uh one of them uh is these citizen data engineers where they are the business users that are building uh, uh the the lego blocks or the reusable data components in data flows for their peers uh and we also see a lot of data flow development being done by pro ETL developers in the BI group in IT or the BI center of excellence, you know, however it's structured inside a given company. So I, I positioned data flows at the start of the presentation as being this citizen tool where the, the primary differentiation criteria or the primary positioning criteria between data flows and a pro tool like uh, Azure Data Factory is that persona. And now I'm telling you that those pro personas, we see a lot of them doing ETL development in data flows as well. And the reason for this comes down to both the fact that Power Query is a delightful tool and experience. So everybody loves Power Query. Uh, and the other part is uh, the people that know that they need to make this reusable, uh, uh, these reusable data artifacts, uh, they are often working in the BI group in IT, not, the, uh, not in the citizen uh, business groups. And for these two different uh, author patterns or authoring patterns, uh, there's three generic approaches, and I I had to struggle a little uh, to figure out how to how to bucketize these or how to categorize these. Uh, but I see for that project proactive uh, approach, if there is a team that has been tasked with building an application in Power BI as part of a project more and more the teams which will often include both IT and business resources they identify what the reusable pieces are and they build out data flows as part of the ETL phase 
in the project. So, you know, th thinking back to uh, the Kimball data warehousing approach, uh, and I, I may be dating myself uh, if I throw Kimball's data warehouse toolkit around. This is where I learned everything uh, that I used to know, and I've forgotten most of it uh, in the intervening years, but uh, they're doing that ETL work uh, using data flows and then building on that for later on in the project. And in this pattern, the project is the incentive for creating the data flows and ideally they will have additional opportunities for reuse uh, outside of that one project. There's also uh, patterns for proactive enterprise data flow creation where the central BI or center of excellence team is going to proactively go out and say what are the what are the places where we could invest in building a data flow to have the most impact so they basically are trying to simplify their data estate and to reap the benefits of using data flows. So all the things that we looked at uh, for those usage patterns around refresh consolidation and ease of discovery and so on, this central BI team is basically saying, I want those benefits. Where do we get the most value from those benefits first? And they'll look at it and they'll say, all right, this is where we want to invest. And they go out and build data flows and, and direct users to those data flows that they've created as part of their central effort. And even though there's overlap between enterprise proactive and reactive, I see different motivations behind these. So they felt like different buckets to me or different categories to me. There's also a pattern where that central BI team as part of their ongoing monitoring and oversight and maintenance of their Power BI tenant, they will become aware of redundancies or inefficiencies like, hey, look, we've got this one data source and it's being used by 75 data sets across all these different workspaces. Maybe there's a way that we could simplify and reduce this load. So uh, this reactive pattern often comes up when the current usage is causing problems. They look at it, they identify the problems, and then they will go in uh, and build data flows to simplify that, uh, uh, to, to simplify the end-to-end -end lineage inside the tenant and to deliver the values that we saw in the first half. Another pattern, another adoption pattern that I see is around content organization and the concept of data workspaces. So I will assume that everyone is aware that data flows can be used across multiple workspaces uh, and there are these reusable building blocks that can be composed uh, to create different solutions. Power BI also supports shared data sets which can be used across multiple workspaces but cannot be customized today. So until the in-flight work around composite models for live connections is, is done uh, and available for customers, uh, these uh, shared data sets need to be used as is. It's sort of the all or nothing, uh, all or nothing approach or all or nothing uh, uh, data model in the service, but more and more successful customers are saying, we're going to have a dedicated set of workspaces often owned by the, the BI Center of Excellence uh, or one of these citizen data engineers, but we'll have these workspaces that only have data flows in them. And part of this is because data flow permissions today are defined at the workspace level. So if you need two different data flows to have different permissions, they need to be in different workspaces. But customers will have a set of workspaces that only have data flows. They will have a set of workspaces that contain shared data sets that build on top of these data flows and potentially other external sources. And then they will have their visualizations, their, their reports and their dashboards in workspaces that reference the shared data sets. And Keep in mind as well, this is not really a self-service pattern that I'm describing here. This is a strategy for a central BI team to structure the content that they produce to enable both uh, uh, central pro BI and distributed self-service BI. 
but this type of structure enables more of the value from reuse by making reuse part of the requirements that you think about right from the beginning. And the pro tip that's at the bottom of the slide or at the bottom of the pattern, this is one of the things that I have only seen a small number of customers do successfully because of politics. In an ideal world, every single asset in Power BI, so every workspace, every data flow, et cetera, et cetera, and every data source, every service that interacts with Power BI, whether this is uh, an Azure data source or an on-premises data source or the Azure data lake storage account that you might choose to use to put your data flow in, uh, all of these, uh, uh, all of these things should be configured deliberately and proactively to use the same set of Azure Active Directory security groups for their permissions. So in an ideal world, this is the goal to work towards, you've got one set of AAD groups that you can add a, add a user to a group or a small set of groups and have all of these consistent permissions just magically flow through. The reason that this is an advanced pattern, the reason this is an aspirational goal that most organizations fail at is that typically the AAD team doesn't talk to the data team. You know, they're both in IT or they might be both in IT, uh, but they are different teams with different leaders and different priorities and neither side really knows how the other side works or the capabilities of the technology. But when I see an organization that has done this, that they've put the effort in up front to have a consistent central set of AAD security groups that are used for their entire data estate, everything is easier. It's like it's like they've turned the management game from the, the default difficulty down to the newbie difficulty because because everything just flows. So I, I won't spend too much time there, but if you do have the opportunity to work with your security or active directory team, you know, bake them cookies, send them a coffee, uh, uh, become their friends because they can make your life uh, easier. Another very common pattern that I see is using data flows to hide data source complexity. And you'll think back, it's like, wait a minute, Matthew, wasn't this one of the usage patterns? Are you lazy and reusing slides? Uh, so yes, maybe, uh, but the pattern, the adoption pattern here is a slightly different take on that usage. Uh, so I'm not gonna name any names, but their acronym is SAP. Oh, wait, um, no, I didn't say that out loud, but there's, there's, some, there's some data sources that are just really hard. And uh, if you ask every user to understand, you know, like the, the complexity to connect to the ERP system or all of the M work that you need to do to actually get JSON out of a paged REST API, you know, th these are things that most users will fail at. And it's something that even developers can struggle with. And Many successful enterprise organizations are using data flows as a way to, to recognize this reality and to say, for the data from these complex systems, we, the central BI team, are creating a supported set of data flows that we manage and make available. And if you want this data, you go here. And they are, they are, targeted at where the complexity and the value is in that source. And once they're in data flows, the follow-up pattern, and keep in mind as well, data flows do not have a concept of row level security. Security is set at the workspace level. If you have permissions to connect the data flows in a workspace, you can get to all the data in the workspace. But with this pattern, that IT group or whatever central team it is that builds the upstream data flow extracting data from these complex sources, they have permissions to access the source data flow or the, the source workspace, but other users, downstream users don't, only these privileged users do. So what they will do is they will create a set of horizontally partitioned downstream data flows 
that will contain a subset of the data that is available or the permissions make it available to appropriate user groups to work with. And they basically build these building blocks, give the appropriate permissions, and set up the refresh orchestration because that composable refresh uh, that will work inside a workspace does not work across workspace boundaries today. And uh, I think we've got one more before we can uh, move into Q&A. And, and uh, there, there may be another slide or two, but I think this is the last pattern. So the other adoption pattern that I see these successful organizations doing is promotion of data flows on multiple different dimensions. Uh, and I wanna come back to the fact that most Power BI authors, most of the people that are working inside of Power BI Desktop on a day-to-day -day basis, they are not doing it for the reasons that the, the the people I assume if you're if you're attending a Power BI user group session, so you like got up at seven o'clock in the morning and said, "Oh, I want to I want to hear this guy talk about data flows." Uh, you are not the person who's doing most of the, the the Power BI development. A lot of Power BI authors they're just using it as a tool to do their job, and once they figure out how to use the tool to do what they had to do yesterday. That's how they'll use it today and tomorrow and forever until they have a reason to change the way that they work. So we need to let them know or the BI Center of Excellence or the IT team or the consultants that are working with them need to promote data flows as a feature. And inside these, these COEs that I, that I work with, they have efforts to promote data flows as a feature to let Power BI authors know how to create them and how to use them. Uh, they will use their internal community to promote specific data flows and sources. And, and this is both, you know, the 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 organizational promotion and uh, as of a few months ago, also the ability to do certification or endorsement promotion inside the product uh, so that just like we've had for shared data sets for a while, data flows will have the, 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 the little logo or the little brand next to them saying that this is the certified official data source uh, and the like. And organizations also use the lineage view in the Power BI workspaces to see what users in what workspaces and what data sets are bypassing data flows. Uh, and that information is now more accessible than ever to make it easy to find uh, the people in the places that are skipping a data flow and going directly against the data source. And then the final thing uh, is that there is lots of opportunities for people to create data flows. So if you have internal training, if you have a user group, if you have like uh, T SQL Tuesdays or maybe data flow Wednesday, I'm not sure exactly where it will fit in because no days start with D, uh, but make it as obvious as possible that people like you, whoever you is, so that Power BI users can create data flows uh, just as they can create uh, other Power BI assets. And as a brief pitch at the end of uh, the slide, I have been doing this year a series of data culture videos on my blog and YouTube channel, uh, focusing on more of the patterns that I see successful customers implementing. And uh, I'd like to uh, to suggest that you go there uh, and we'll we'll share the URLs afterwards as well. Uh, but do take a look at the resources that are out there. For additional resources, uh, my team has contributed both to some general guidance documentation, best practices or patterns and practices uh, for working with Power BI in the enterprise. Uh, we also have some data flows best practices that we helped author uh, and both Chris Webb, who is a colleague of mine, uh, ex-MVP uh, and uh, awesome presenter as well. Chris and I will both regularly blog about data flows uh, and data culture uh, 
uh, topics. And I also want to mention I used some of Chris's Dataflow slides as the raw materials going into the slides that we've used today. So thank you to Chris if you're on the call and you notice some slides looking familiar, credit where credit is due. Thank you for letting me use them. So with no further ado, let's uh, let's take some of those questions. So I'll let you verbally relay them and we'll see where we go. OK, I will start with a simple one, but also a good one. How do I know if my organization needs data flow? Very fundamental. Uh, so uh, are there opportunities to simplify the management of data sets that are using multiple that are that are using the same data sources in redundant ways uh, or are there uh, is there functionality that we want to have included so you know features or data that we want to have included in a data warehouse where the data warehouse team is not able to deliver on it. So this this honestly, I think is probably the hardest question we're likely to have. <laughs> the, the ones that seem simple are often very difficult. So I want to ask a different question back to you. How would you know that you need self-service BI in the first place? And as a pitch, go to my YouTube channel and watch my brief history of business intelligence video uh, where I talk about this at greater length, but IT driven BI introduced a set of problems and self service BI arose to solve that set of problems. And of course, it introduced its own brand new set of problems. But data flows are a self service tool that solves a problem that traditionally uh, a professional ETL and data warehousing would solve. So if your organization or your team or whatever the scope that you're working in, if you can't keep up with these traditional tools and you need either more efficiency or the ability to let uh, less data professional people deliver data preparation and data warehousing like functionality, that's what you look for. That's the sign that data flows can be useful. OK, uh, do data flows work with analysis services, both tabular and multidimensional modes? how authentication uh, works in this case. Uh, so let me let me throw out a disclaimer. Don't do this. So anytime <laughs> that you're using an analytics model as a data source for bulk ETL, you are going down a road you do not want to go on. You are building a house of cards and sooner or later it's going to fall. There are many organizational and technical reasons why using an analysis services model as a data source for any ETL is an awful, awful idea. So if you go down this path, you will think back to the, the, the purple guy with the swords. He warned you and you didn't listen. Now, with that said, uh, uh, yes, data flows can pull data from analysis services. I do not know the details of exactly what scenarios are or are not supported uh, but I have so here's here's I, I gave you my disclaimer I I do what I say not what I do I actually have a data flow that one of its data sources I am getting from the XMLA endpoint from a shared data set in premium uh, uh, which is using the analysis services tabular connector I have never used or seen a data flow that pulls its data from a multi-dimensional cube, uh, SSAS multi-dimensional, doesn't mean it can't be done, just means that I have never seen it or done it myself. But uh, don't do it. I think the question is just okay. the opposite. Uh, I think he's asking about, can we use data flows oh. as, a, as a data source in analysis services? Okay, so the, the way that you can do this is by configuring Power BI either at the tenant level or at the workspace level uh, to store data flows data in your uh, organizational uh, Azure Data Lake storage account. 
The default configuration is that data flows put their data into an Azure storage account that is only accessible to Power BI. So Power BI is the only writer and the only reader. If you want anything outside of Power BI to be able to work with the data that is created when you refresh, uh, uh, when you refresh your data set or when you re refresh your data flow, you need to use your organizational uh, account. Uh, yeah, so it, it is possible, but you need to use ADLS Gen 2. OK, uh, do, do you see the new Power BI Premium per user license? as affecting the adoption of data flows. It's the new licensing schema and it is free during the preview, I guess. Good news. Yeah, that it, it is good news. And honestly, I'm really, really excited to see the, the premium per user announcement being made. Um, the, I, 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 I am not the best at predicting the future. So will it affect it? Yes. Uh, because it will give more people more opportunities to work with those features in data flows that are premium only. The value or the, 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 the real thing that seems significant to me, I shouldn't say value, but the, the premium capacity licensing provides unlimited consumers. So it, in premium today, premium as we know it, the value prop comes from being able to deploy to premium and then nobody needs a pro license to consume it. So, you know, you can basically have free users that that work with the stuff that you put onto your dedicated premium capacity. That is uh, a, a key part of the value prop for premium as it exists today. For premium per user, every user who authors or consumes the work that is created uh, in a premium per user workspace needs a premium per user license. And we're not talking about pricing, but I assume that the premium license, premium per user will be more than a pro license is. So there will be a different, uh, a different licensing calculus or cost calculus involved. Uh, so it, it will be neat to see. Uh, I suspect, and I, I, I recognize some of the names that are in the chat as well. If you are an MVP or a consultant who is part of a small organization uh, working with larger customers, today I'll bet it is difficult for you to justify the annual expense of a premium capacity to get access to those features that are premium only. You will be able to get immediate and I assume significant value from premium per user because the the monetary barrier to access these premium only features is going to be much lower. Uh, but I'm interested to see how this will uh, play out for enterprise adoption where they may have thousands of users who are working with reports built on a data flow or built using data from a data flow, they're probably not going to get premium per user licenses for all of those thousands of users who are reading rather than writing. Okay, uh, next question. Would you have central workspace for all your enterprise data flows? Does it matter if they are all in different workspaces? It does matter because workspaces define the security boundary. If you have all of your enterprise data flows in one workspace, this means that all of those data flows are accessible to the same groups of users. Uh, I suspect that this is not what you want and that you want to have marketing data and HR data and sales data, you know, wh whatever the, the, the categories are, you have different data that needs to be accessible to different users. In data flows today, the that that permissions are set at the workspace, and very often I see organizations structuring their data workspaces with the permissions set as their primary requirement. Okay, uh, should we use data flows to load, replicate most of the data from the corporate data warehouses, or just the most widely used data by users? So, so let's let's pick that apart. So, so data flows provide data warehouse like functionality. If you already have a corporate data warehouse, you need you need a reason to put data flows in the mix, right? You you never want to put an additional step unless that step is adding value. And my my gut reaction is if you already have a data flow, sorry, if you already have a data warehouse that has a table 
that has the data and people can get to it, data flows don't add any real value except for that discovery and connectivity. Because what you're doing is you're just duplicating the data. You're you know adding refresh delay and probably uh, data flows. You know if if you've invested in a good data warehouse server, uh, data flows may not have the uh, the performance that your data warehouse does. So uh, so don't think about moving everything into data flows. Think about where data flows actually make sense for the problems that you're trying to solve. And I will also mention it is eight o'clock. We are technically at the end of the time. I do not have a blocker and I am happy to stay uh, to answer additional questions, but I want to be respectful uh, of the event schedule as well if that's not an option. Well, I have lots of time. Uh, the questions are coming. Uh, we have 10 or 12 questions to answer if you have time. Excellent. We, we'll, we'll say we'll make uh, 30 minutes as the hard stop because I do have an 8.30 on my calendar. OK. Uh, will there ever be a convert tool that converts Power BI desktop queries into Dataflow JSON file? Uh, so uh, let me let me add as a disclaimer that until future functionality is publicly announced and is put onto uh, the Power BI release plan, I cannot announce anything. I cannot talk about work in progress until we have announced it publicly. So I'm going to give you an evasive non-answer instead of a yes or no answer. So let me say uh, that the Power BI team or the Power BI data flows and the Power BI desktop team are very aware of the barriers that the current authoring experience put in place and understand that data flows will get more adoption, you know, more usage and uh, uh, have more impact if the authoring experience was more seamlessly integrated into the end-to-end -end Power BI app authoring experience in Power BI Desktop. Uh, so not promising any particular work, any particular time frame, but I do want to say that the, the struggles that I called out in this presentation and that your question implies are very well known and understood and are a priority in our planning. OK, uh, regarding Azure, Azure Active Directory permissions, should they use existing organizational groups or use group just set up for workspace? Uh, uh, so, 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 so the structuring of security groups is its own dark art. Uh, so this is an area where there's a lot of complexity and a lot of nuance and best practices that I only know from a distance. So the 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 full solution is probably going to be a combination of the two, where the the existing organizational groups exist and will be and 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 the existing organizational groups are what users are added to so you know a new person gets hired they come into a new role you put them into the existing groups because that's how the business works and we know that that's how the business works because that's how these groups were set up in the first place but we we put the users into those groups and ideally you will be able to use only existing groups to assign all of the permissions that you need on the workspaces and the underlying data sources and the like, and it just works. Creating new security groups for specific cases should be done on a case by case basis, but be aware that when you find a situation where the existing organizational groups, you know, for a uh, for an established organization, if the existing groups aren't doing what you need, that's kind of a red flag to say, let's look and understand, are we approaching the problem in the wrong way? Why is our is our new part of the world different than the rest of the world? You know, why are we a special snowflake, excuse me, why are we a special snowflake flower? Uh, anyway, so I, hopefully that answered the question. <laughs> yes, yes and no. It okay. depends. <laughs> Is the end result of creating a data flow in Power Apps or in Power BI the same, assuming you are loading data into uh, a DLS account in Power Apps? Uh, so, so uh, again, yes and no. 
the the data that is being created is being created by the same code and the same Power Query Online experience, and it's outputting into the same format. The so so this this is a surprisingly complicated space as well. So Power BI data flows, there Power BI is just a natural fit for this type of. Uh, data warehouse like functionality because BI applications they need data preparation. So it's 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 where Power BI sorry it's it's where Power Query evolved and grew, and data flows in Power BI these analytical data flows they're a logical fit. In Power Apps, different people are using Power Apps to solve different problems, but they still need to get data in right. Uh, so. Uh, the data flows in Power Apps either give you the ability to load to the common data service, like a more traditional ETL tool loading into the data source where uh, uh, where your transactional data is being stored, or they can uh, uh, load into an organizational ADLS Gen 2 account. If you do load into the organizational ADLS Gen 2 account, it is functionally identical to what Power BI is doing, uh, at least for the storage of the, the data in the CDM folders in the lake. But because Power BI uh, has different uh, di different concepts like you know Power Apps has environments, Power BI has workspaces. It's not easy to do an apples to apples comparison when you get down to the very low level. So yes, with some exceptions. I'm not good at short answers. <laughs> uh, but you, you are very good at answering. We all know that. Uh, Next question, best practice for complex transformations, linked computed, computed across multiple data flows, etc. Uh, so, so look at the documented best practices that are linked to, uh, that are linked to in the, the slides. So uh, the most important thing to keep in mind is how the, uh, how the enhanced compute engine works. So as a, so let me back up one step a little, I guess. If you have meaningful data volumes and meaningful complexity in your transformations, don't expect to be successful with data flows unless you're using the enhanced compute engine, which is a premium only feature. So this is the, the space where that compute engine is designed to help. And the way that the enhanced compute engine works is when you load data into an entity, in addition to writing out to the text files in the lake, those, those CDM folders, it's loading data into a SQL instance that's managed by the Power BI service so that other downstream queries can go against the SQL tables and take advantage of the, the power of an actual database engine and query folding and the like. And this means that you need to structure your queries so that the queries that do the complex heavy lifting, we've got our data sources over here, we've got our what I think of as staging data flows. So we, we bring data into the service, but we don't do a lot of transformations. The downstream data flows, whether it's one hop or two hop or however many hops it is, they will be going against data flows that have this SQL cache on top of them. That's the pattern that you that you work to implement. Beyond that, a lot of it is really situational. There will be places where you will see an obvious performance benefit from uh, from splitting out multiple steps so you might actually introduce uh, a, a data flow as an intermediary step where your logical processing doesn't demand it but just the performance realities uh, require it and there's one additional thing that I want to call out and that is that at least as of today the power query online experience when you're building a data flow and you're using data flows as a source that Power Query Online experience always reads from the CDM folders. It does not and cannot today use the SQL cache to get that better performance during authoring. So there may be some things that are like really agonizingly slow when you're building the data flow that the performance is just a non issue when you're refreshing. So this is yeah, this is one of the other things that comes in. 
Okay, can you migrate data from existing Power BI data flows to the common data service? I I don't know. Uh, I would say I would say you can you can copy the query and paste it into uh, a Power Apps data flow to load into CDS. Uh, I I've never done this, but everything that I know says that it should be pretty simple. But there's not like a migration tool or anything. Okay, in Power BI data flows, are linked entities any faster than non-loading standard standard entities? Uh, so they're they're different. So if you have a non-loading standard entity, what you've basically done is you've created a block of M code. So if you use reference against a query that isn't loaded, uh, every query that references it is basically taking the M code from that non-loaded uh, that non-loaded query, and it's just inlining it so that the the queries that are running they include the, the the query that was referenced and that means that if you have a non-loaded query and four different entities that reference it when those four queries refresh all of them are running this code which typically means all of them are going against the upstream data source for a linked entity the 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 data that is being accessed let me let me rephrase it slightly differently for a linked entity when those four other referencing entities refresh they are not running this code again they are pulling data from the cdm folders or sql cache uh, that was created when the upstream linked entity was refreshed so i guess the short answer is yes it's faster uh, the longer answer is how faster and how or how much faster and the details will depend on what that that query actually does okay there is one specific question regarding Parquet, Parquet. I, I, I might be, I might be mis, uh, mispronouncing that name. Uh, Parquet. If I convert a file to Parquet using data flows, P A R Q U E T, yep. uh, and load that data flows to desktop, will it lose the compression of that file? Compression of Parquet. Uh, so, so the the short answer is yes. Uh, if you are uh, if you are doing anything in data flows today, when a data flow refreshes, the data that is being created by the by the refresh is in CSV. So if you're getting data from Parquet into a data flow, it's going to be CSV data. But that end to end flow of going from any data source into desktop, you're you're always losing the the storage characteristics of the data source when you pull the data from that source. So this isn't really unique to uh, to data flows or unique to Parquet as a storage format, but when you query a data source, the data is not in that format anymore. It's in whatever format you're going to be storing it in as it, with the output of the query. Okay, when, when do you recommend to use Power Apps data flows? Instead of uh, so, so the Power Apps data flows exist for citizen application developers who need to get data from other places to include and to work with in in their uh, uh, in their Power Apps. So it really depends on what sort of app they're building, uh, where they need to get data from, and the like. It's just another building block or just another tool in your toolbox. Uh, as you're building a, a power app. OK, uh, audience is obviously uh, admiring your abilities as a presenter. <laughs> oh, I thought you were uh, going to say swords, <laughs> but I guess uh, thank you. <laughs> OK, one, one of one more interesting question. What is what is your favorite movie TV show with your with, with sword play? Um, so there is one. So it, so let's let's let me let me an, let me answer with a question to start with. <laughs> what movie or TV show have you seen that did a really good job representing data professionals and the nuances of working with uh, data in the real world or computers in the real world or technology, right? So when you when you get close to any 
domain, any knowledge domain or behavioral domain, the expertise that you develop ruins popular culture for you. Because I, I don't know which Avengers movie it was, but there was some Avengers movie when it's like, oh, the internet goes through Oslo. So we need to go to <laughs> Norway because this is where the internet lives. Uh, and in sword play in movies and TV is very much like this. So everything, everything that you see on the stage or that you see on the screen, it's designed for you to see it. It's designed to be flashy and interesting and wow, that was really cool. Uh, and if you're actually fighting with someone, whether it's with a sword or a knife or your hands, you want your actions to be fast, unpredictable, and brutal so that no one sees it until it's done and it's too late for them to stop it, which is great for fighting, but it's awful for, you know, for TV shows. Uh, and uh, a friend of mine, David Rawlings from the London Longsword Academy, actually, he did a YouTube video for, you know, some entertainment channel in the last couple months where he examined uh, sword fighting scenes from like The Witcher and Game of Thrones and, you know, a, a bunch of other movies. Uh, he did a great breakdown on this. I would say that for me, the most fun is the princess bride so it doesn't try to be real it doesn't try to be fancy but it's fun it's fun to watch and it fits beautifully into the narrative which is really what you're uh uh what you're looking at and yes uh matrix for data princess bride for sword play is sort of just put into a, the comment so that's a it's a good uh, uh good analogy there okay uh uh, from me, personal question: What is your favorite band from Manowar? <laughs> what my my favorite band other than Manowar? Um, uh, so it's it's these days it is probably Amon Amarth. They're a, a, a Swedish death metal band or melodic death metal band that sings a lot about uh, a lot of Norse mythology and similar themes. Uh, I've been listening to them more than anything else in the last couple of years. Uh, it's just it it hits the spot. Uh, it, I'm going to answer a slightly different question. If I could choose to see any band, you know, any band that's still around uh, uh, in concert that I haven't seen before, there are two Swedish bands. There's Tiamat and Lake of Tears, which are both a little goth, a little hard rock, a little metal, uh, but they're both these these really uh, uh, underrated or underknown bands that every time that I listen to them, I just love them, uh, but they almost never tour and I've never been able uh, to get to see them. OK, very good taste of music. Uh, will you share your slide deck? Uh, I will share some of them. Uh, so the I guess the, the, the key thing is that this is the first time that I've delivered these slides. I'm still trying to find out what works and what doesn't. So yes, I will share them. I'm not exactly sure in what format, but uh, I will send something uh, to make it available for download. OK, thank you. And uh, as usual, uh, we, we are publishing our webinars on our YouTube channel after this session, maybe two or three days. You can watch it and if Matthew share your uh, his slide deck then I will put the link. Wonderful. I think we are all done. Uh, thanks a lot Matthew. It was a hell of a session. Well, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity and maybe next year or the year after we'll actually be able to travel again and we can do it face to face. But thanks very much to everyone who has come. Thank you for all the wonderful questions and I can't wait to see what additional questions come out of this. So thanks very much. Have a great one and uh, ig enjoy Ignite and all of the other announcements for the rest of the week. Thanks a lot, Matthew. Thank See you. See you everyone. Bye-bye. See you everyone.